The rest of you, I would like you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 7. We're not going to get there right away, but Luke chapter 7 is where we're going to anchor ourselves today. So just put your finger there, wet your finger so you can move around in some verses together. But nonetheless, Luke chapter 7 is where we're going to find our home place this morning in in this series where we're trying to freshly apply the Word of God in contemporary issues, things that we face, things that we struggle with, things that we try to, to understand. And when we come to the understanding that we are faced with these things, and we realize that we have been called to be the Jeremiah's of our culture, because we've taken a little break from our series in Jeremiah, we've been called to be the Jeremiah's of our day, and yet we still need to reflect on how, how am I supposed to do that? What about this and what about that? And so we're, gonna, we're taking a little break to deal with some of them, some of which you have provided to us, and we'll try to address them as best as possible. We've limited our, our summer series to just a few messages because, frankly, this is hard work. Um, and, and nonetheless, but we, we want to be able to do that. And so when we come back to the Word of God, we are... We are reinforcing that we understand that we as God's people must continue to go back to what the standard is and that standard is found in the word of God we're not to reformat it we're just simply to re-engage it and make sure that we are staying anchored to it and and allow it to be the the whole basis of our faith and our practice and, and such mindset is under attack today. And so we want to continue to remind ourselves that, that the Word of God is the standard. The other day I was uh, golfing with Steve Bucci, who just made his way to his seat here. And uh, he was so happy. He's doing his responsibilities. He was so happy because uh, he, he got his first birdie in his lifetime give him a clock yes it's first birdie yes but one of my roles in Steve's life is to make sure he keeps both feet planted on the ground and so all golfers know that there's this unwritten rule you're allowed to have at least one mulligan a mulligan for those who don't understand it is you get a do-over and and if you're really bad like we are then you get at least one mulligan per nine holes so Steve, Steve has, uh, he, he, he has one of the best second tries in the game of golf. And so he hit one and it was really bad. And so he said, I'm going to take my mulligan. So he takes his mulligan and he hits and he goes out there and, and he's so excited because this, this drive was good. His approach shot was good. He's on the green in less than regulation. He puts it in and he gets his birdie and he comes off the green and goes, that's my first birdie. I said, well, Steve, you realize you took a mulligan. You just ruined my first birdie. I said, well, no, it's still a birdie. I mean, we we have set the rules that, you know, you're allowed to have a mulligan. But technically, there is no such thing as mulligans in golf. This is why people make millions of dollars we're chasing a white ball all around the place because you don't get second tries. You don't get mulligans. You have to earn everything. So there's always a standard. We always have to figure out what that standard is. But sometimes, sometimes there are those who try to write special rules and it makes us feel better because it lowers the standard. And that's what we cannot do when it comes to what the Word of God says. So we are living in a day and age where the battle lines have been drawn. There's no doubt about that. And, there's, and we're in a day where there leaves little room for the uncommitted when it comes to issues of sexuality. Now, this is not a subject that's comfortable to talk about especially in a mixed audience, but it's something that we must continue to talk about because we have a culture that is not allowing us any more room for being uncommitted. We are in a time where there will be no place to hide and there will be no way to be silent. 
We are being pushed up against the wall. And for the most part, that's a good thing. We have to know what we believe and we have to stand by what we believe and we have to live what we believe. But that's the real question, is it not? The real question is what are we going to do as Bible-believing Christians in this age where we're being forced to commit and to be true to what we believe? Will we remain true to the Scriptures and the clear teaching of Scripture and over 2,000 years of clear teaching? Or will we cave to the tremendous pressures from without, but sadly, even within the church to change? I believe the answer to that question is obvious for churches like Calvary Bible Church because we say we are a Bible church. We want to keep coming back to the Word of God. So it's fairly clear what the answer is. And so here's what I think we have to keep in mind. There's, we, we must affirm the Reformation decree. The Reformation was great for many slogans, but this one is the Norman Normans, which really means the norm that norms or the rule that rules. When they're talking about sola scripture or the only the scripture... What they're saying is, and what they would cry is, the Scriptures are the rule that rules. It's the norm that norms. It's the standard by which we determine what is right and what is wrong. And if we want to be God's voice to our generation, we have to come back to what God says. And so there we have to keep it. There we have to stand And we have to make our stand. And when culture begins to push us, we've got to come back. So we need to understand what the Scripture says. Unfortunately, the church has not always done a good job in being the voice of God on these issues. While it's true, we do have the clear teaching over 2,000 years of tradition within the church since it was started in the book of Acts. And even before that, in the Old Testament... We have these clear teaching and this unbroken history of proclaiming these truths. We have been at times very harsh and insensitive on how we proclaim these truths. And it's that harshness and that insensitiveness that has gotten us into a little trouble. So we haven't always done a good job. Even more troubling, and as your pastor, this is... This is what scares me the most. Even more troubling, we have been hypocritical. Refusing to acknowledge that we too have a problem. We don't always live out the truth of God's Word. We don't always act and behave and think as the Word of God directs us. We're in a battle. And the younger the generation that we have, the more and more extreme that battle becomes. And so we're in trouble. If we don't acknowledge it, we are in big, big trouble. We must address this. We cannot remain uncommitted. We cannot be silent. We must address it. So it's troubling for me. And the result of all of this, the the, the the insensitivity and the harshness or the hypocrite uh, that we, we, we see so much and hear so much about because we are inconsistent. The, the end result of all this is that we have, as a church, been pushed to the margin and our voice has become background noise that the rest of the culture is just simply tuning out. So that begs the question. Do we really have any hope whatsoever of being the voice of God when no one is listening? I believe that if we reaffirm what God has established as truth and model our approach after Jesus rather than the history that we all know about, we've just referenced, we can be that voice. But we've got to go back to the scriptures and I think we can get a great model in our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we just sang about. And it will give us direction on how to address it. So I just have to ask you to bow with me and pray because I believe God wants to speak to our hearts and help us to become a church that is open and honest 
and is willing to deal honestly with the sin that so easily besets us all. And so we have to approach the Word of God with a sensitivity to hear from Him. So play, please join me. God, we, we recognize that this is not a fun subject. It's not even an easy one. I can think of a lot of things I'd rather speak about this morning than this. I realize that our culture is trying to shut this message down. I realize that Satan wants to wreak havoc in our lives with the things that we want to expose this morning. I also recognize that the church is being beaten up because we try to put our heads in the sand Try to pretend that we're not losing the battle when we are. Our chains have been broken, but unfortunately, far too often, we chain ourselves and we allow sin to trip us up. We have to come back to your word and we need your spirit to work in our hearts so that we can proclaim your truth with an honest heart this morning. And we pray that you'll do that work in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, just like last week, when we're talking about these contemporary issues, I want to continue to go back to foundational truth. So what I want us to do is I want to do that this morning. So I'm going to ask if you would turn back to the book of Genesis Because Genesis is where all of this issue of our sexuality and all that is started. And we must go there. And so there there are passages of Scripture that we go to, we argue about because of some of the issues that are surrounding creation and all that kind of thing. And, And I get that. But sometimes we miss some of the very simple truths because our culture continues to try to confuse things. But in Genesis chapter 1, Verse 26, we know this is the creation account. We know that they're involved in, in, that we're we're being told about how God created everything that exists. But listen to the words of God here. We've referred to this passage over and over again because it tells us, it gives us worth and value. It tells us who we are. And here's what it says in verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God, he created male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And so these are foundational truths, and First thing we have to know when we look at a book, a passage like this, is first and foremost, God created us in His image. We can't escape that. Man, female and male, reflect the image of God. We were created distinct and different from the rest of the creation. We were given status. We were given Um, a position above the rest of the creation because we were made in His image. That gives value. That's why all life is sacred. That's why all life matters and should be valued. That's why we choose life. That's why we don't condone the abortion of babies. That's why we don't condone euthanasia where we kill off the old or we discard those that are unhealthy or unproductive. We value life. Why? Because every life bears the image of God, and therefore it must be protected. And so 
we, we come to these truths, and we talked a little bit about that last week. But not only did God make us in His image, He made us distinct. He gave us male and female. God has created us and established our identity and purpose in creation. He made us male and female. The other thing that we see, and especially as it's uh, translated or brought into the New Testament, this male and female, what we have to understand is the unity of man and woman in what we call marriage. This unity of man and woman is in some way necessary to fully represent the image of God. He made them male and female, both created in His image. So this is why we understand that woman is not to be devalued and man is not to be elevated. Man and woman are equal in Christ Jesus because they both have value. They both have the image of God. They may have different roles and responsibilities, but nonetheless, they are equal in value and purpose and sacredness because they bear the image of God. Gen Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 we have another um, explanation of all of this. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, it says this. And this is after all the creation. And, and God, we have another account of what took place. And, and we get further detail. And Adam has been given the responsibility to name all the Adam, uh, animals. That, that was his first job as one who was given dominion over the earth. He was there to rule and reign over the creation. He was there to take care of the creation that God had made. And so he's named all these animals. And then it says in verse 18, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field and every bird and every heaven and brought them to man to see what he could call them. And, and, and that's what happens. And then, then God takes out of Adam that rib and, and he creates Eve. But at this passage is one of those anchor passages for what, from which we get the definition of what marriage is. God created us in his image. God created Marriage for man and woman. Genesis chapter 2 verse 22, 24 takes it even further and drives the point home of the sacredness of this thing. In verse 24 it says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. God created this institution called marriage to be for a man and a woman. And Genesis chapter, 20, chapter 2 verse 24 states that this marriage that God created is the norm that norms. It is the standard of standards. It is the rule that rules. This is what God has created. So this is the norm for God's creation. And if you don't understand that, all you have to do is go to the New Testament and Matthew chapter 19 where Jesus is being asked about divorce. So just turn there for a, for a moment. Jesus refers back to this passage, Matthew chapter 19, in verses 4 through 6. Jesus affirms this foundational truth of Genesis 1 and 2. In, that, in Matthew chapter 19, verse 4 through 6, here's what it says. And he answered... Have you not read that he who created them, referring to God, from the beginning made them male and female, and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What God has therefore joined together, let no man separate. Then the issue of divorce comes up and Jesus has his answer. That's beyond our scope for this morning. But what I want you to see here is Jesus anchors himself back to this foundational truth found in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. Reestablishing the fact that God created us with identity and purpose when he made us in his image as male and female. And he created this thing called marriage for man and for woman. Paul states 
that this marriage that God created back in Genesis, and we reaffirm by Jesus, but if you look in Ephesians chapter 5, one of those passages of Scripture that we go to often when we are reflecting on marriage or we might be in a wedding, but Ephesians chapter 5, when Paul is talking about this whole concept of the mystery of the church, and then he brings in the illustration of marriage. Lotus chapter 5, verse 22. It says, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. His body and in, in himself is, is Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to everything in their husbands. Now, in our culture, that gets really the heckles up a little bit. But you have to understand that you have to realize what's being said here. There's a, there's a balance that's being given because then he goes on to speak to the husbands. And husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it. Here he's talking about servant leadership. The man is to be a servant leader just like Jesus was a servant. He came to seek and to save that which lost. How did he do that? He gave of his very life for the church, for you and I. That's not about being macho. That's about being a servant leader. I'm willing to give my life for you. Anyway, I could go on that for a long time, and I'm not going to. But anyway, the fact of the matter is, is that here's what it says, that he might sanctify her. This is talking about the role of a husband. He's to give himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, cleanse her by the washing of the water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. And so here we have this picture, this divine metaphor that's being played out for us to help us understand the sanctity of marriage. Marriage is to be a reflection. Our marriages in our church are to be a reflection of the relationship between Christ and his church. And we wonder when we look around, we wonder why the world walks away from the church. And I would suggest to you one of the reasons, not the only one, but one of them is perhaps our marriages really don't reflect something that is positive about the relationship of Christ to the church. And so people walk away. We can't put our heads in the sand and pretend this isn't going on, folks. It is. Paul wants us to understand there's something divine about this marriage thing that we call. That's why we need to fight for it. That's why we need to guard and protect our hearts and our minds so that we hold up as best as we can through the power of the Spirit to a lost and dying world to reflect the image of Christ in the church in the way that we live out our marriages. This is serious business. We, 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 we can't play games. We can't pretend that we can live whatever way we want to and people are going to listen to us. They're not. And so we have to elevate our identity and our purpose. We have to elevate our marriages and recognize that we need to work hard for them because it's part of our responsibility to be God's voice for our culture. The problem is we struggle with it because we, we don't take seriously the commandments of scriptures. Look in 1 Corinthians Chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 11, it says this, Paul writing to the Corinthians who struggled in the area of sexuality, who, who, who got it all wrong. Remember chapter 5, this is on the heels of chapter 5, where there was sexual immorality in the church. It's not new. For, for us to pretend that we don't have a problem is silly. The church has had a problem from the beginning. Our biggest problem is we won't admit it. So here we have this. Paul deals with that. And then in chapter 6, verse 9, here's what he says. 
Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor the idolaters, nor the adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were set apart. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. You see, this passage reinforces that our relationship with Jesus Christ changes our relationship with the flesh and with sin. And I, before we get so critical about certain one of these sins, especially the sexual sins, I want you to notice the context. The context has a whole bunch of different kinds of sins. And every time we hear this, we need to recognize that sometimes we have these really, really bad ones, and then these, well, there's, these are kind of the okay ones. These are the ones that are kind of acceptable, you know, well, we need to, do, you know, we really need to work on that. But these are really bad ones, and we point our fingers at these, and we, and, and, and we try to cover these up. The context here is sin is in the church, and we need to deal with it. Why? Because we are fleshly. Why? Because we live in a world that is cursed. Why? Because we have the evil one who is firing the evil darts at us. We are under spiritual attack. And until we recognize it, we are just vulnerable. What this passage tells us is, is that it condemns a variety of lifestyles, including those of sexual na nature. This is reinforced by the fact that, by the truth that we are called God's temple in chapter 3, verse 16, and then in chapter 6, verses 25 through um, 30. Notice what it says here in, in verse 20, well, 15. It says, in, well, we'll just pick it up in verse 16. And here's what it says. Or do you not know he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is written, the two become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. And every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But sexual immoral person sins are against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Whom you have from God. You are not your own. Why? You've been bought with a price. Romans chapter 1, one of those horrendous passages when it comes to just the awfulness of what has taken place. And we see the outpouring of that in various times throughout our history on this earth. But it seems to me that it's coming to the highlight even and more so in this day. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Here we're talking about the, the gospel and and that God's wrath is on the unrighteous, and, and therefore the, the, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it is the power of God to salvation. Apart from the gospel, man is hopelessly and helplessly lost, and Paul is going to run through it in the first three chapters and say we are all sinners. We all have to battle the fact that we were born depraved. We were born sinners. And then we have spent much of our life demonstrating that. But in Romans chapter 1, verse 18, Paul kind of continues on talking about the wrath of God, and he says this, verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. That's why it's so important for us to understand if we're guilty of one thing, we deserve the wrath of God. Then he goes on, he says, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For the, His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. In the things that have been made, so that they, referring to all men, are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, 
and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Then it goes on and gets even worse. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For the women exchanged the natural relations for those that are contrary in nature. And the men likewise gave up the natural relations with women and were consumed with a passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving themselves the due penalty of their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, keep in mind, every one of these things in this context, it's all about walking away from God. And when we walk away from God, we lose our perspective, we lose our standard, we lose our way, we forget who who we are, we don't have identity, we don't have purpose, and so therefore we meander throughout life and whatever is the latest fad becomes whatever we do. Because we've forgotten God. That's what this passage is saying. Why do we see our culture? Why do we see our world in the state that it is in? Because they've forgotten God. Why has the church found itself in difficulty? Because they've forgotten God. So here we go. I'll continue on. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to debase minds to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness and evil and covetousness, malice. They were full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malicious. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless hearts, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. This passage is an indictment on our culture. We have to see it. We have to understand it. We're told in this passage we're not to engage in these activities. And this passage isn't limited. Did you notice? It's not limited to the sexual. That's what we're talking about today in particular, but it's not limited. Did did you see the idea of gossip? You see the idea of envy and slander? All those are lumped in there together. We're not to practice these things, is what we're being told. And even more importantly, we're not to approve of these things going on. We have a responsibility to keep ourselves in check. We're not to engage in these activities. We're not to approve of them. And participation in such is part of God's divine judgment on our culture. God gave them up. Thinking they were wise, they became foolish. Even though they knew, they refused. As a matter of fact, it's a beautiful grammatical illustration that's found in Romans chapter 1. When it talks about what they knew about God, they chose fit not to live it out or to, to acknowledge it. The idea is they took the truth that they knew, they put it in a box, and then they sat on top of it so nobody would know that it existed. They hid it away. If you ask me, that is an illustration of our culture in our day. There is so much evidence of the existence of God. God has so much of his mind, his norm, his rule, his standard. There's no escaping it. We have this book available more today than at any other time in our history. There's no reason for us to be ignorant on these things. But man has taken it all and hidden it away, lived in denial, and they worship the creature rather than the creator. We mentioned this last week, but I want to say it again. I want to say it this way. The depravity of man necessitates that God establishes the norm for human behavior and our need for the gospel to reform us to that norm. I want, I want, you, I want to unpack that statement just a little bit. Our depravity, our sinful nature necessitates that God establishes a standard for His creation. Jeremiah and Isaiah both use the analogy of God being the potter and we being the clay. 
God's the one who designed us. God's the one who gives us purpose. God's the one who gives us identity. When we get confused, we need to continue to look to God who has given us His identity and our purpose. We need to keep coming back to the fact that God is the one who establishes the norm, not my feeling, not my social uh, structure, not my culture, not what everybody else is saying. God is the one who establishes the norm, the standard. That's what I need to keep coming back to. God understood because of our sinful, depraved nature, He had to establish the norm. And He did so. And it's called His Word. He established the norm for us because of our depravity. Romans, the whole purpose of Romans is to let us know that yes, you're depraved, you're sinners, you're hopelessly lost, you have no way of saving yourself, except there's this good news called the gospel. We need the gospel. Here's what we need to understand. Apart from the power of God and the presence of God in our lives, we have no hope because Jesus Christ came to this earth to die on the cross to set us free from our sins in order that we might have life. But we have no hope of living in that way apart from the gospel because the gospel changes our hearts. It gives us eyes to see and to understand His Word and to be redirected in the power of His Spirit to walk in a righteous manner. When we get our eyes off of that, The confusion of culture only complicates our own confusion, and we end up in a mess. So the depravity of man necessitates that God establishes the norm for our behavior, and and, and it establishes our need for the gospel to reform us. But we live in a day of complete chaos. Our culture has been publicly processing sexuality for many decades. And it's become even more and more public. We now live in a time of ever-changing ever expression of opinions, and both in the political and the religious arena. The tone of this public conversation that we've been involved in has shifted from camaraderie, where there was some solidarity, there was some agreement on things, this is right, this is wrong, to a point now where there is no solidarity and it has moved to open hostility to those who want to hold to the norm that norms, to the standard, to the rule. Remember, we went through First and Second Peter for a reason. We recognize that there's going to be pressure and persecution from within the church and without the church. We went to Jeremiah for a reason. Jeremiah was the voice of God and they broke him. We have to be prepared for that because there is a growing, open hostility. And because of that, many, even within the church, have chosen to discard or abandon or reinterpret the clear teaching of Scripture in over 2,000 years of unbroken history of proclaiming those truths in regards to human sexuality. Here's what I want to say. When we look at all of it, deviations from the norm established by God, such as described in Genesis 19, where you have the Sodom and Gomorrah thing, and if that's not bad enough, then you also have Lot and his daughters and all that kind of stuff going on. The standards and the norms that are established by God, such as described in Genesis 19, prohibited in Leviticus 19 and 20, are to be understood in the Old Testament context as part of the covenantal people. They were to be understood as rebellion against God's created order. When you fast forward into the New Testament in the age of the church, some of the covenantal responsibilities have been removed, but there is a repetition of the standard on how we handle ourselves sexually, how do we handle ourselves socially, how do we handle ourselves personally, are repeated in the New Testament and reinforced and anchored back to the Old Testament. Any deviation, old or new, is considered to be rebellion. And we can't escape that. God is not pleased. And so what I want to do with the time that we have remaining, and I hate that clock sometimes. Luke chapter 7. 
I know you guys love that clock because it's going to be done soon. But Luke chapter 7. I want us to look at the example of Jesus. We, we constantly need to come back to Him. And what I wanted to do is just read a few verses in Luke chapter 7. In verse 36 and following. I'm not going to read down through the end, the, the end of the story. There's a parable that's told. But the point that I want to get to is in these first few verses from 36 to 40. You'll remember this story from your Sunday school days. And it, here's what it says. One of the Pharisees, remember the Pharisees were the religious leaders in Jesus' day. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house, and he reclined at a table. And behold, a woman of the city, read prostitute, harlot, whatever you want to put in as, as a word. As a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster flask of ointment, very expensive, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair on her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him, referring to Jesus, saw this, he said to himself, in other words, he's thinking in his own mind, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Now notice the next verse. The little subtle things here. Verse 40. And Jesus answering. Now where was this going on? It was going on in the mind of the Pharisee, but Jesus answered him. And listen to what he says. Simon, I have something to say to you. Whoop. What we need to understand here is there is an interaction between a religious leader and Jesus in connection with one who was called a sinner. And what we see is the way not to do it and the way to do it. Notice, here's what I want to ask you a couple questions. I want you to ponder on these things. What if you were put in Jesus' place in this passage? You had been invited over to a religious leader, well-respected religious leader, and this sinner woman comes in and she starts adoring you and worshiping you in this manner. What if you were put in Jesus' place? Would we respond the same way that he did? Or would we respond the way like the Pharisee? Would the woman be drawn to God through our life and our conversation? Would we be willing to risk the ridicule and the condemnation of the religious in order to point this woman to truth? The clear point that Jesus is trying to make as you read the rest of this passage, the clear point is we should be happy that this woman was turning to God in her sin and not to be indignant and self-righteous. This is the same principle that's brought up in Luke chapter 15 where you have the parable of the prodigal son. But it's really not about the prodigal son, it's about the older son. It's not about the younger, it's about the older. And the older in his righteous indignation, self-righteous indignation and his anger over the returning the repentance of the younger brother i love a couple of quotes from tim keller in his book the prodigal god well worth your reading and he may, and he says he says about this passage and luke chapter 15 in particular the crucial point here in luke chapter 15 in general religiously observant people, hear what he's saying, religiously observant people were offended by Jesus. Study the life of Jesus and see how many times the religious, the churchgoers we might say, got mad. The crucial point here is that in general religious observant people were offended by Jesus, but those who were estranged from religious and moral observances were intrigued and, and attracted to him. Now, isn't that ironic? Even more pointed is this statement later on when he says, if our churches aren't appealing to the younger brothers, the, the sinners in search of God, 
They must be more full of elder brothers, the Pharisees and the hypocrites, than we like to think. If you want to get slapped around theologically and, 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 and uh, religiously, read Tim Keller's book, Prodigal God. He's going to give you a couple of right crosses. Because what he's saying is true. Why is the unbelieving world so detracted from us? Perhaps it's time to look inside. Perhaps it's we have modeled more the Pharisee in our harshness and insensitivity. insensitivity. We have modeled the Pharisee in our hypocrisy. And the world says we want nothing to do with it. I think Tim Keller has a point. So what are we to do? How are we to live? I want to run through a couple of points here. I want to talk about our commitments. In the last several years, the church leadership has been working on a document about human sexuality and marriage, just to kind of define what we believe the Word of God says. We start that document up with these commitments that I want to share with you today. And I want you to understand this is the vision that we have for our church and for ourselves. Here's our commitments. Number one, we are committed to communicating the truth of God, paying for our sins through the sacrifice of His Son, Jesus Christ. Living out this truth in word and in deed is a trust that demands that we are open-hearted to all people both here and around the world. We can't allow our culture to get ourselves all incensed to where we begin to hate people. We have to take the truth of the gospel. The only real peace is found in the gospel. And a world who hates the ones who need to be reached, a church who hates the one needs to be reached, is just like a Jonah. We can't do that. Commitment number two, we are committed to support any and all in their relationship with God through Jesus Christ. This means that we will acknowledge our own imperfection, we're a mess, you're a mess, I'm a mess, and be patient with each other as we collectively wrestle with the patterns of thought that war against our right relationship with Him. We have to become open and transparent. We have to be willing to risk being honest so that we can all move towards Christ together. We are, number three, we are committed to assisting any and all towards a fuller expression of the character of Christ in their daily lives. This means that we will hold each other accountable to God's standards unadulterated by the cultural whims of the day. And commitment number four. We are committed to a godly tone and rhetoric in all conversations. Our commitment is to speak our convi convictions with precision, but humbly with loving and empathetic and respectful words. We are not here to condemn. We are to point people to Christ. So here's the bottom line. We must seek to love all people in Jesus' name, pointing them towards Christ's power to forgive and to heal, seeking God to discern ways that we can directly or indirectly minister and share God's love with those who are struggling with every kind of sin. What we've been given is not an easy task. We have a history of being harsh and insensitive. We have a history of being hypocrites. The Bible says revival begins in the house of God. And we need to deal with our sin. As Jesus described it, why are we worrying about the splinter in somebody else's eye when we haven't removed the plank from ours? God is calling us to repentance. If we're going to be a church that is the voice of Jeremiah, we need to recognize we have our own problems. And so when we come across people who are caught up in sin, we need to have hearts of sympathy and empathy. We need to have hearts that long to say, join me on the pathway to Jesus. He's the answer. He's the one that can give peace. He's the one who can conform us and get us back on track with our identity and purpose. God is calling us to be the voice to our culture. If we play the game and act the part, we lose power. 
if we fall on our knees before God, proclaiming our sinfulness, seeking His power to transform, then we have a right and an opportunity to speak in a world that is filled with chaos and confusion. This doesn't answer all the questions, but it's where we have to start. Let's pray. Our God, we thank you for your word. We recognize that you have set the standard. We also recognize that we far too often fall victim to fudging on the standards, to pretending they don't really apply to us or pretending that perhaps we're better than what we are. And so therefore we're not honest with each other and we're afraid to speak into our world's chaos. God help us. We're to be your voice. But if we're going to be your voice, we need your heart. And that can only come through the power of the gospel, which is given to us through your son, Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God that resides within us. Make us into your people and your voice. In Jesus' name we cry out. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and just close with this prayer, asking that we would be the voice to the world by asking Christ to just be all around us. That's our desires, that he would be seen in us and all that we do and say. Christ be all around.